I am Bob Coopin with Lauterbach. Today, along with my colleague Dennis Griffith, we are going to discuss and demonstrate debug and trace of complex heterogeneous systems on a chip that incorporate RISC-V as well as other microprocessor cores. First, some background on Lauterbach. Lauterbach is the global leader in hardware-based debugging. We've helped engineers debug complex systems since 1979. The emergence of RISC-V has meant that many of our users are developing SOCs that are incorporating RISC-V along with legacy processors. The Lauterbach Trace32 debugger provides a very robust environment for development, debug, test, and quality assurance of these SOCs. Lauterbach debuggers are used throughout the entire development cycle, from chip bring up through driver and BIOS development, application development and debugging operating systems such as Linux or FreeRTOS or Zephyr. This can all be done in a single environment for debugging and tracing RISC-V along with other processors such as ARM and ARC and Extensa and SIVA and many others. We are able to do this and protect your investment in Lauterbach by our universal, extensible debug and trace tools. For example, if you already have our ARM debugger, that can be enabled with RISC-V debug. If you are using our universal trace unit, that can be enabled with RISC-V trace supporting Sci-5's Nexus and Ultrasoc's trace encoder. So let's see how you can get the most out of developing and debugging your complex heterogeneous SOC with Lauterbox Trace32. For that, I'm going to pass this to Dennis, who has an RDZ7 board with a RISC-V and ARM V7 on the Xilinx SOC. The FPGA also includes the core side infrastructure from ARM. Our Lauterbach debugger is enabled for ARM and RISC-V debug and trace. Thanks, Bob. So inside that FPGA, we have two ARM cores and run RISC-V core. The RISC-V core is implemented in the FPGA programmable logic. The two ARM cores are built in as part of the silicon. The first ARM core is generating a square wave. We're not going to uh, control that with Trace32. It's just going to free run and generate the square wave. The other ARM core will generate a waveform based off of that and the RISC-V as well. So let's look at the Trace32 GUI. You're going to have a GUI for each architecture or subset of systems. In this case, we have the ARM core on the left and the RISC-V on the right. We also have a window that's showing the cores that are being controlled by Trace32. Not all of the cores, because remember I mentioned that third core. And you're seeing that third core actually modify memory, basically building an array of a square wave pattern that both the ARM and the RISC-V are going to behave and act upon. Now you will notice that these are independent. If I start the RISC-V core, you can see that it's running. You can see that that waveform is being generated. And I can stop it. I can also start and stop the ARM core independent of each other. Now notice that that third core did not uh, do anything. It's still running. We have the capability of controlling uh, the system so that the two GUIs or the two cores can interact with the sync bus. What we're going to do it is, is tell this the RISC-V what cores to talk to. So we'll just say others, which is a nice keyword that says any others that are in the system let's communicate with. And we're going to tell the master, which is basically the transmit bus, that if you have the events go um, break or step to send that to the sync bus and the other GUIs will listen if we enable them. So let's enable it. So I'm going to go over to the ARM core and tell it that it wants to connect to the RISC-V. And I'm going to tell it to listen to what the RISC-V is doing. So in this situation now when I start and stop the arm starts and stops synchronously. Now that's not the case if I go over to the arm core. I can start it and stop it and the RISC-V is still just stopped. That's because we haven't told 
the arm to send the signal and the, the risk v to listen. So we will change that situation now. So now if we tell the arm core to go, the risk v will go. And actually, if we go over here to the risk v if we tell it to stop, both of them stop. So you can build a complex uh, configuration or interaction between the cores. And just to, to drive this point home, we're going to go ahead and set a breakpoint. We're going to set an advanced breakpoint. So let's get this breakpoint going here. Actually, I want it here. And we'll show you the break list window. We'll go change this one. We'll go to the advanced window and tell it to break after 200. Ooh, 200 is a good number, though. We'll add that. We'll remove this one. Should have just pressed OK. So now we'll go, and you'll see it counting up. You'll see both processors are running. You'll see that the RISC-V actually is running a little bit slow, and that's because these are doing what's known as intrusive breakpoints, so they don't necessarily run at real time. That's what that red S was indicating. Okay, so now that we braked, you'll notice that both processors broke at the same time. So these work for breakpoints as well. So I just wanted to show that interaction between the, the two cores using that uh, sync bus so that you can understand how those interact. Okay, next we're going to start a trace demo that shows, in essence, how you can use trace to help you debug and evaluate your system. Just to show you some windows, I have the, the list window that is showing you, in essence, what code is and how it's located in memory. You can see the program counter is down here at the end of this function, sieve, just before we do the return. We have a trace list window. What this window shows you is what code was executed over time. So that's pretty busy, so I'm going to reduce the amount of noise that's there. And you can see as you walk back through, we're down here at line 763, which is the for loop. Maybe I should have these over a little bit. And you can walk back and you can see that we were executing these and doing flags and so forth. This is showing what the code flow was over time. The newest or the most recent is at the bottom. The oldest is at the top. And you can see we executed that forward and we're about to start executing the return. Additionally, we have some charting functions that will show you what that code flow looks like graphically. So if you're not interested in as much of the detail, you can see it. And I really like the chart function window, which shows you which functions are called over time. And I tell people, you can think of this as a sequence diagram that's been laid over on its side. So we have timing information, and you can see those functions. And speaking of timing functions, a window I definitely like is the statistics window that literally it's looking at your code and analyzing that trace buffer and seeing what code did you uh, execute over time and how many times and what does that look like. For example, we have function 1 here that was executed four times. Each time it, the execution was 1.57 microseconds. And so you can get an idea looking at this, how often your functions are called, and what an impact it has on your performance. The important thing to consider with this is I didn't have to instrument my code. All I had to do was turn on debug signals, symbols. All I had to do was turn on debug symbols and load it into the tool, turn trace on, and run. And it automatically collected those statistics based on this information. OK, 
Okay, so this is how you can profile it. So how do you get to these? We have the trace window. The configuration will show you the hardware that you're using and some of the parameters that it has. In this case, we're using on-chip trace, and there are 4,000 records, approximately, and we used them all. We have the trace listing windows. We have timing windows, if you have timing information, and we have charting. So you can see symbols, which is a little bit different, but very similar. For this statistic window, we have various performance measurements. So we can show numerical, which is this one here. You can also see it as a tree. So you can see not only the information statistically, but you can see how they're oriented in the uh, call stack. So the one that I like is function 1. You can see that came from function 9. And function 9 was called once. So you get an idea. And one of the things you can see down here is function 13 seems to be a little bit recursive. Maybe that's a good number for it. So this is briefly how you can collect statistics, statistical information based on uh, your trace information. And that's very highly accurate. OK, so next I want to move to how would you debug something like this? So to do that, I'm going to set up a debug environment. So I'm going to load some windows. OK, so this is a typical debug session. Let me show you some things. I'll switch this back to high-level language. We're in the function sieve. We've taken a breakpoint right before we do the return statement. So that's where the program counter is. Over here, we have a couple of windows. This is the var.table. It's showing an array. In this case, it's flags. And it's indexes, i and k. And so as you go through time, you will see how those indexes and what uh, variables they're pointing to. Right below that, we have the var local. So this is showing the local variables of C. If you see i, prime, k, and count. Right next to it, you have a couple of windows that have I've frozen in time. So basically, these are showing the values frozen right before we do the return statement. It's a great way to create little notepads. You can take a window, you can freeze it, and then it's there while you do other debugging. OK, so I'm going to turn on the trace based debug. That is known as CTS. You can get that through the trace menu pick. We're going to turn it on. But before I turn it on, I want you to notice the uh, program control buttons, you know, the step and go and break. Right now that's normal. And then down at the bottom, you're going to see the status line as well. I want you to take note of that. Because when we turn on the CTS system, you're going to see those turn yellow. And in fact, for program control, there are going to be some additional um, buttons that allow you to step backwards or step to the entry. So this is enabled with the CTS system. OK, so what we're going to do now is start stepping backwards. And you can see the index pointer, I, basically go back through that table. And we can keep hitting the step backwards. And we'll see the I slowly walk back through this array. And eventually, we, we will see K. But I'm going to zip right back to the entry of the function C. And in this case, you'll notice the global variable went to question marks. And the local variables are also uninitialized. This is because there was not enough trace buffer to collect enough information to know what values should be in flags. Remember, we only had 4K of records. With a deeper trace, you can get more information. Hopefully, flags would end up with a value. So we're going to start stepping through. And you'll see those variables get initialized. And actually, you're seeing the pointers up there again for i and k. Now we can start stepping through. And you'll slowly see um, i advance. But in this case, it's like this is taking a long time. So I'm going to take advantage of the function uh, we call diverge. And what diverge does is keep a record of all the statements we've executed before. 
and it will only single step, it'll single step until it gets to a record that you haven't hit before. So when I hit this button, you'll see I go right to the next line, which we've never executed. So now we can single step through and start looking at it. And we get to the point where we want to set a breakpoint or somehow we want to interact with it because we don't think this function is doing the correct thing. Now you'll notice when we try to set a breakpoint, we can look at variables. We can see their values. Remember, this is the recording because we're in CTS. This is not the current values because the current value of i is 19 and k is 54. So what we're going to do is a function called takeover. And what that's going to do is write the local values directly to the memory. And we're going to put the system back in that state of time. Notice, when I try to set that breakpoint, it says you're not allowed to do it because we are in that recording. Can't change the movie in the middle. But what we can do is take over. And now the system is like in that state where I is one, count is one. We can set a breakpoint. We can change the count value if we'd like. It becomes very flexible. So this is a way that you can go back in time, if you have that in the trace buffer, and change things. Look at what's happening, see how the variables are interacting with each other. Um, you can take over, you can go, and in this case, we've stopped at the breakpoint. We can clear that breakpoint, we can go again, get to the return value. You can see that we affected um, count, but not i and k. They came back with the same values, as well as the flags uh, array are the same. So this is a great way to go through and, and debug backwards in time. The final area that I want to talk about is code coverage. So let me clean up my windows. You need a list window with the coverage option. And then you start the tool from the coverage menu pick and the configuration. The way it works is it collects information from the trace buffer and it adds it to a database that's scorecards. So all you have to do is collect some trace and add it. This means that you can do real-time trace with no instrumentation. It also implies you can do this over a long period of time because you can fill up a buffer, add it, fill up a buffer, and add it. This allows a lot of flexibility in your testing environment. Additionally, we have different types of metrics that you can apply to the code so that you can see what code has been hit or not, including statement, object code, functions, and so forth. Additionally, if you want to report, we have a tool that will generate reports. You can script this if you need. Normally when you run it from the GUI, it will generate a web page. Behind the scenes, it's actually generating HTML files, so it's very flexible. Again, it runs off trace, so you can do multi-core, no instrumentation required, full speed code coverage. That's all I have time for. As Ladebach continues to enhance our debug and trace support for RISC-V, our users will be able to use the RISC-V trace information acquired to get a more comprehensive understanding of the design. For example, with our trace-based profiling, they will be able to perform detailed analysis of function runtimes and test runtimes and state, along with graphical analysis of variable values over time. The debugging of RISC-V designs is greatly enhanced by the ability to use the trace information to debug backwards and forwards and re-debug a traced program section. The trace information can also be used to establish the code coverage of your design and generate metrics for statement coverage, function coverage, and object code coverage. For more information on our support for RISC-V, please stop by our booth or visit lauterbach.com.